we can kind of walk it through parts of the Gospel of John. And there are, there are these two little words that pop up in the Gospel of John uh, that Jesus says these two little words. And, and they might not they might not strike you. Um, but we've taken time to unpack. You know, what, what it is that he means when he says, I am the bread of life. You know, we, we need daily nourishment, not just for our bodies, but for our souls and our spirits. And, and Jesus is that nourishment, where Jesus says, I am the light. Uh, there are times where, where our lives are dark, where there's confusion, and, and we wonder which way that we should go, and, and, and who should guide us, and he says, I am the light. Uh, there are times in our life when we need direction, we need to know what is the right way, what is the way, which of all the different ideas and ways and circumstances out there, of all the different things that we can do, what, which one is the right way? And, and Jesus says, I am, I am the way. And, and this is, this is one, this is one of my favorites, I don't know why, um, maybe I should have thought about that before I decided to preach on it. But Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branch. And, and I mean, if we just want to have a, a psychological moment right here, I, I would imagine that my favorite part of, of the I am the vine, you are the branches, because it puts me in my place, in my rightful place, and because uh, I'd like to be the vine, I'd like to be the gardener. Um, and, and we read this story about that there's a gardener, and, and there are, there's a vine, there's one true vine. There are all kinds of other vines and weeds, and, but there's one vine, and off of this one true vine, there are these branches. And, and it's this beautiful metaphor and analogy because we, we don't, maybe we're not botanists, and some of us don't have green thumbs, but, but you get it. There's a vine, and it has branches. And if the vine is not connected to the branch, it withers. It can't grow. And, and very simply, Jesus is saying, hey, I I'm here to give you life. If you, if you get plugged into me and lean on me and depend on me as the vine, um, I've got this. You know, my father is the gardener. He, he's going to take care of you. He's going to tend you. He wants to see you grow and, and be abundant and have this, this great life. So I'm going to read to you this, this story where Jesus is talking to his followers. And I invite you to, to follow along. This is John chapter 15. I'll read verse, beginning in verse 1. Listen now. This is the word of God. I am the true great vine. <laughs> let's, just, let's just pause um, just for a second. Go back to Jesus' day. Um, anybody, can anyone guess what they grew grapes for the purpose of making? Okay, good. Wait, so we're all on the same page. Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit, so they will produce even more. This, maybe this reads kind of harsh to you, but, but go back to, I said, he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit, so they will produce even more. The same word for prune uh, in, in the original language can also be, and, and, this, and this would be a, a vineyard wine practice. Uh, another word for prune is clean. And, and so maybe maybe it, it reads a little bit nicer that, that he cleans the branches. Look, some of us need to be pruned. Okay? And, and we're in a place where, where we need somebody to come along with some pruning shears and go, no, that's not going to help you grow. Um, he prunes, he cleans the branches that do not bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned, clean, purified by the message I have given you. So remain in me, and I will remain in you. The same word for remain is dwell. The, the, the fun one that I'd like to hang out on today is, is abide. You know, if, uh, anyone who's a fan of the Big Lebowski, you know, the dude abides. Um, we're going to talk about the word abide. What does it mean to abide in God. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain and abide in me. Pretty simple, pretty clear so far. So in verse 5, Jesus says, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart 
apart from me, you can do nothing. <coughs> Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch in withers. Such branches are gathered into a cloud to be burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. So a couple things that, that, that are true. Jesus says, I am the true vine. And he, and he says, I want you to be my true disciples. Whenever we read a passage and, and there are matching words, it's important for us to know that that was on purpose. But, so, so we would say, okay, the true vine, the true disciples. How do, how do you become a true disciple? By bearing much fruit, it says. We're going to talk about that as well. But just a few verses down from this passage, Jesus seems to restate the whole thing and, and just kind of puts it in a different package. And, and I wonder if the disciples had this funny look on their faces where Jesus goes, I'm the vine and you are the branches. You know, remain in me, I'll remain in you and you'll bear much fruit. And then they go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he says, do you guys get it? And they go, no. <laughs> I don't, no. We, we like wines, we like grapes, we like wine, but what? And so, commonplace for the disciples to kind of go, I don't get it. If we're honest, um, it's probably something that we need to say more often. They go, I don't, I don't get it. Can you repackage this? Can, can you just explain it to me in, 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 in a more simple, clear format for, for my brain? So in, in very plain language, again, in verse 9, Jesus says, He says this, I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. So remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This, and you, and you can see them going through all the Old Testament laws and commandments. And they're going, there's 638 dietary laws. We're supposed to obey all of those. And Jesus goes, hold on. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Boil the whole thing down. You can see the disciples going, can you give me the Reader's Digest version? He says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus is starting to foreshadow his own crucifixion, his own death. You are my friends if you do what I command. He just told us the command, right? I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me. Amazing to think that the God of the universe, who, who many of us have wrestled with that, this idea that he's, a, he's an old, angry white man sitting on a cloud, you know, just waiting to kind of, and, and right here in one felt spook, Jesus says, hey, it, it's not so much. You know, I am God. I am almighty. You know, and, and I'm everywhere, and I'm all powerful. But Jesus says, hey, I call you my friends. I could call you my peons, but I call you my friends. I mean, there's, there's an acceptance, there's a welcoming, there's a scary equality that Jesus says, look, I'm lowering myself to, to be right there with you. You are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. <coughs> so that the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. This is my command, love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Very quickly, in a plain, straightforward way, remaining in Jesus means remaining in his love. How do we remain, abide in Jesus? By being obedient, by obeying his commands. What is his command? Love each other. What does love look like? 
Love is selfless. It puts others ahead of us. Jesus didn't have to, but he laid down his life to be with us. That's the model for our love, that we would lay down our lives for someone else. Who are Jesus' friends in this passage? The disciples were his friends? He's speaking to you this morning as friends. And what has he chosen and appointed, made us for bearing fruit? It's the whole passage. It's a great passage. And I remember um, that, the, 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 that my favorite, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's, that's, the, that's the favorite part of the, of the passage for me. Because sometimes it, I think I get this, this glimpse, you know, God's about to do something. He goes, okay, wait, here's, we're going down here. And I go, okay, I got it. I got it. All right. I'm going to do it. And then I get over here and I go, wait, what was I supposed to do again? Because I made this, I made this mess. And remain in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so this passage gives us some fairly simple ideas to grasp when it comes to understanding how faith works. God the Father is a gardener. Jesus is the true vine. Not to be confused with all the other weeds and ideas that are out there. And we are the branches attached to the true vine. The Lord Jesus is the true vine. And, and the word true, just to, to, to put it out there, is, is primarily used in two ways in the New Testament. And, and first of all, it denotes that which is true or genuine in contrast to that which is false. And, and so surely, then, Jesus is the one genuine vine whom we should abide. And surely we understand that there are all kinds of, you know, find your inner chi, chai, chai, wait, chai tea. <laughs> find your inner chai. Um, you know, but, but there are false ideas. We could just about worship anything. We could just about follow anything. We could just about, in today's day and age, you can put anything as your number one priority. You can just about pick anything and say, my life is all about this. And, and so surely we understand that there are some false, silly ideas out there about what we could follow. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. The word true is also used for that which is the, the ultimate realization, which is a, a heavenly, eternal reality which transcends the here and now of an earthly life to something that goes forever. And I think then that Jesus is saying, whereas the vine was a picture of Israel in the Old Testament, he is the fullest realization of Israel's hope, of Israel's expectations, of what God intended for her to be. And you remember the story of Israel. You remember the story of, of the Jews in the Old Testament, that they're wandering in, in the desert for how long? Thank you. Um, you. You remember that when the Ten Commandments came down, they chose an idol and said, they said, you know, this golden calf, would just, this, would be, this would be easier. Uh, and, and when we read the whole story, Israel's going, can you just give us a king? We'd rather follow a king than you. That would just be a little bit, a little bit easier. Um, an objective reading, I, I think, an honest reading, can you tell me, uh, Israel has a vine in the Old Testament, was a failure. They failed utterly uh, at being that vine connected to God. It had never achieved its goal. So Jesus comes and says, now I'm the true one who came to accomplish everything that Israel failed to do. Friends, let me hear you say, wait, you hear me. You hear me say, say this. This is the God of second chances. To, to come and say, hey, Israel failed. But guess what? I've got this. I'm the true mind. I can make this right. I'm the God of second chances. More over than that, to read it this way, God is able to redeem your failures, my failures, to make good, to reconcile anything that we have messed up. So as the true vine, he says this, I am the source of life and strength and fruit. 
that there's, there's a relationship that has complete dependence between a branch and the vine. Right? They absolutely have to be connected in order for a branch to really produce anything. This vine gives life, gives nourishment to the branches. Apart from it, a branch has no life, it has no fruit. And, and so our responsibility as followers of the way, as followers of, of the light, is to abide in Christ. In the, in the Gospel of John, where, where all of these I am statements, where Jesus says, I am, I am, I am, John is really fond of, of capturing all the times that Jesus uses the word abide. It shows up over 50 times just in the Gospel of John, and, and in just chapter 15, it's there 11 times. And underlying the idea behind abiding is the idea of belief. The idea of obedience. The result of that is an intimacy with God that cannot be experienced uh, in any other way other than abiding. For him to say, abiding in Christ means to obey my command. And my command is to love each other. Abiding in Christ in the very simplest term is trusting God, seeking to obey Him. There are no special techniques or formulas. It is as simple as a belief and a behavior. And, and your belief and behavior match. Abiding in Christ provides us with life and strength, and it's the only way to lasting fruitfulness. We know that there's a familiar passage in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, where Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit. These are the fruit when you're, when you're abiding in God. These things are going to be produced in your life. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. And Jesus gave us a very basic, simple command. Right there in the vineyard. And he says, love each other. That's the very first fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Jesus says, love each other. Abiding in God, dwelling in God, making our life in God, starts to produce this fruit that he wants to see that we were made to produce. It sounds simple, but what it takes from us it is a lifelong commitment to, to working at it. A lifelong pursuit of trying to be the disciple. Trying to live life as Jesus would if he were walking in your shoes. If he lived your life. No plant casually and just kind of randomly produces a lot of fruit. Sometimes it's a slow process, but it's always a purposeful process. And there's always a season of fruitfulness. Now it does take our effort to abide in God. But that when we get off track, that we would pick ourselves up and then come back, and that we would accept and seek His forgiveness, His grace, that we would continue to seek to follow the way of God. Now in every garden, in every vineyard, in every life, there's an opportunity to be discouraged, right? There's weeds, insects, mildew, disease. In every life, there are elements that can hinder the production of healthy fruit. And it would be easy to become discouraged in the idea that our life is in this vineyard. And it would be easy to think, I can't, I can't seek him, I can't abide in him. There's so much guilt that I carry that, that I just can't get connected to the vine. I've tried it before and it didn't last. I'm frustrated. I'm tired. I'm 
fatigued. Life has got me exhausted. I don't want to bear anything else. No more weight. And if so, if you listen to that, you go, yeah, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I've tried it before. The, the guilt is just, I can't, I can't come into his presence. There's so much guilt. This is about as close as I want to get right here. The encouragement that I would give you is that when you let God, the gardener, direct your path, you won't be tired in the work of bearing fruit. You won't be stressed. You won't be confused. You'll simply bear fruit and enjoy the process of God guiding you through that. Jesus spoke in very simple ways a lot of the time to very simple people. And so it's not getting outside of the object lesson. How many of you have ever seen a grape or a grapevine that was stressed out? Have you ever seen, you know, a banana tree go, am I supposed to make bananas or apples? Can you imagine the blueberry bush crying in his bedroom, banging his blueberry fists and saying, I just can't make blueberries anymore. Those things don't happen, obviously, because plants naturally produce fruit. They have the loving, wonderful, guiding hand of a gardener. They don't have to do anything except what they were designed to do. If you're exhausted, in your place of life right now, you might be in the wrong place of life right now. It might be time for a change. It might be time to seek out God's direction a little more honestly, a little more intentionally. Healthy branches don't get stressed out. That's not to say life is always going to be perfect. It's not. But when the gardener is directing and pruning and cleaning, then we can trust that we're being taken care of. Healthy branches don't get stressed out. They simply bear fruit. Maybe you're trying to make bananas and you're an apple tree. You may be stressed because you're trying to do something that you're not <coughs> made to do. The owner of the vineyard does not want you to do something that you're not made to do. He wants you to produce the fruit in your life that you're supposed to. And he's already given you everything you need to do that. There is a story. I got a story that's about guns. All right, ready? <laughs> Danny Simpson. Danny Simpson lived in Ottawa, which is in Canada. The year was 1990, and Danny was stressed out. His life was not producing fruit. He was desperate. He was broke. He did not have the resources that he needed to survive. He was short on cash. He was even shorter on brains and skills. He had run out of time, he thought, he had run out of options, so he took a gun that had been handed down to him through the family line, an heirloom of sorts. He went to the bank and said, this is a holdup, and they gave him $6,000. Remember I told you that Danny was short on skills and short on brain, and Danny was not very good at robbing banks, in fact, he was promptly arrested. At the trial, two significant things happened. First, Danny was sentenced to six years in prison. His opportunity to succeed in life had diminished in seconds. But second, as the courtroom looked at the evidence, people began to really look at the weapon that he had used. It was a 45 Colt semi-automatic the kind that gun collectors salivate over. It was an antique. It was made by the Ross Rifle Company in 1980. And its street value was more than $100,000. Did you catch that? You see, Danny robbed a bank for $6,000, all the time holding $100,000 in his hands. In other words, Danny already had what he needed to produce.
fruit in his life. He just didn't know it. Now, before you walk out of here thinking that I told you to go rob a bank today, <laughs> hear this. You better give the church 10%. <laughs>
Oh, those are going to be nice. <laughs> the, the three areas that, that really kind of drive the whole, the whole event is there's music, there's food, and, and there's fundraising. Um, the, fun, the fundraising is, is just uh, spread the word. You know, to, to bring people. The purpose is to raise money to give to the people who have lost incomes, votes, jobs, to help them. Um, I, I, I talked with, with the owner, Paul, and he said, we, we don't want a penny. We want it all to go to the employees. We want everything to go to the families. We love what you're doing. We wish we could be there. It's a great idea. It needs to go to the, funny, the, the families. If you know someone who can donate something, I know it's short notice. We wanted to keep the momentum of this going. Um, people were looking for a way to rally, and, and we said, we can be in Iceland. <laughs> There's no royal we in this one. Um, you know, I, I said, we can help, we can do everything here. So, if, 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 you know, to talk, talk to me between the services, or call in the next day or two if you've got some, some fundraising ideas. So I know people have been texting and emailing and Facebooking. I've got auction items, great. Uh, somebody dropped, dropped out jewelry to me today, and I went, can you hold it until Thursday, please? Um, so, so, so the fundraising aspect, Tricia? Okay, awesome. That's awesome. You would like to donate some haircuts. Can we talk about it? Um, okay, good. Awesome. That's great. I, I don't know anyone standing up here who needs a haircut, but if there are others, <laughs> I'll be happy to pass the word. Caitlin, stay in your seat. Stay in your seat. <laughs> there are other people in the interviews. There are definitely other, other people. So just like that, just like if you've got if you've got something you could you could donate here to, to make it to make it work. Um, to, you know, here's the goal. The goal again is to show this community that that we take Jesus' command, love each other seriously. If we just have been talking about it for five years and the opportunity comes up and we go, well. It would be really good if somebody did something to help them out. Then what are we doing here? Do we get it at all? Um, cooking spaghetti is, is, is we could use help with, with noodles. Um, what we could really use help is the spaghetti sauce. Bill, Janet, am I, am I saying this right? Spaghetti sauce. But not, you know what? You've got this little two quart saucepan. Uh uh. Did you hear Bill? Uh uh. Get your big pot. You know, and that's a uh, thousand people, that's a lot of sauce. That's we're gonna get sauce here in Kirk of the Keys Thursday night, and we need you to we need you to help with, with the sauce. If you want to bring some bread, you wanna I I have been told that the Methodist church in town is gonna to provide desserts. So that's really that's amazing that they were willing to help out like that. If you've got a super secret recipe for key lime pie that you feel like needs to be here, make it. Um, you know, if, 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 that's your, if that's the fruit that you produce, don't make spaghetti sauce if you're going to burn it. If you're a baker, you know, let's, let's be smart about this. Everything that we just talked about, there's a certain kind of fruit that you can produce to make this work. But the music, uh, everybody look up here and say hi to Billy. Hey guys, Billy, right? Billy, Billy is uh, easily the most important person in this church Sunday morning because he makes everything sound good and beautiful. And we don't do that. Uh, we're talking about using the fruit that you're made to produce. I don't know. We've got 10, 12, 15 local musicians that want to come here and provide music. We're going to have five hours of music. Um, Patty Isaac is going to logistically kind of to, to make everything work smoothly. And Billy's going to run sound for all of them. And, and he would not let us pay them. So give Billy a hug today. The band, the band has waived their normal appearance fee. <laughs> to, uh, to, I think we, we go on uh, from 8, 8, 15, 8, 15, so if you're, if you're up that late and you want to hear, hear uh, I can't speak for all the other bands, but uh, I, know, I know this band rocks. Um, and lastly, you know, I, I can't cook. I can't make desserts. I'm not, you don't want me counting money. Um, I can't play an instrument. Here's something you do know and that you can do. The, the, the people who have never been here before, who are going to come here, really need. They've never been here before. They don't know anything about this place.
Forget about how warm and loving and accepting it is. They don't know where they should park. They don't know which door they should come in. They're, other than a bajillion cars, they may not know they're at the right place. It's kind of dark here outside at night. If you know anything about front of some temporary lighting, hello. Um, if, if you can just stand around and be here, as, as you know what, this is God's house, and it's your house, and it's their house, too. But they've never been given the tour. A thousand people drinking lemonade, drinking coffee, eating spaghetti. You know what they're going to need to know? And you, you know where they are. I bet money. Um, very simple things about saying, hey, here's where the music's going to be. Here's the kitchen. Uh, here's where the restrooms are. If you can hear Oh, you need to know where you can go smoke? There's ashtrays all outside this place. You know, people from the community are going to come here. We're going to treat them like royalty. We're going to love them the way that Jesus has loved us. And so we need your help. There's a sign up right in the back here. Everybody turn around. You can see the big black poster with the white that you came with. That's it. So sign up. Call us. Email us. Text us. We've spent all morning talking about the importance of loving others. You know what's funny? But they're never done. This will be funny. Um, I plan I plan the sermon series. We're going to talk about I am this, I am that, I am, I am, I am the branch. And, uh, and, and it's just funny that the Sunday before the event, the sermon is about loving others. Isn't that funny? I'm not that good. In case you didn't know, I'm not that good. Um, we spent all morning talking about the importance of loving others. Moreover, we've spent the last five years talking about how important it is to love our community. And so this week, we get the chance, thanks be to God, that we get an opportunity to put our faith into action. And so I want to invite you um, to get your faith into action, to, to let God know that you want to abide in Him. We're going we're to do one song and then we're going to dismiss.